Very good evening to you. Welcome to ITV News this Friday night. Yes, good evening. Here are tonight's main stories. One man's badly hurt while thousands of travellers face disruption as Storm Otto swept through our region today. I'm in Sheffield where a man in his 50s is in a serious condition after being hit by this tree which was toppled in this morning's gales. Meanwhile, tonight, electricity engineers are working around the clock to try and restore power to more than a thousand homes. Brothers in Arms were at a secret location in Yorkshire where British soldiers are training Ukrainian civilians to protect their homeland from Russian invaders. I'm live at Wakefield Trinity ahead of the start of an historic season at this historic rugby league club. It looks like the Bramble family are having a cup of Yorkshire tea. And say cheese, find out how these photogenic mice in a Rotherham back garden are winning fans all over the world. Hello, thanks for joining us. A man seriously ill in hospital after being hit by a tree which came down as Storm Otto battered large parts of Yorkshire. It was a difficult start to the day for travellers right across our region with roads, rail networks and our largest airport seriously disrupted by winds gusting up to 75 miles an hour. Well, we can cross live now to John Hill, who's at the scene of that accident earlier this morning in Sheffield. John, what exactly happened there? Well, Laura, this is the Endcliff area of the city, Endcliff Vale Road, in fact. And just look, this is the tree a mature beech tree which was toppled by what must have been a truly powerful gust. As you see, it's been ripped up from its roots from the drive of this property. And then if you come down, I think this probably gives you an impression of just how powerful that, that wind must have been this morning. Just look at the diameter of this mature tree. So it fell across the road and actually then the upper branches hit a property on the other side of the road, which is actually a student's accommodation, University of Sheffield accommodation. A number of students were inside that building at the time. They've had a lucky escape because the branches seem to have done no more damage than perhaps dislodged a few roof tiles, although the property has now been cordoned off and it's been evacuated. But sadly, a man in his 50s uh, was struck by the tree. He's in a serious condition, so we expect to get perhaps further updates tomorrow. Elsewhere, trees have been brought down. Have a look at these pictures from Harrogate. This shows a tree that had fallen onto a Porsche, also damage to a Range Rover. But there have been trees being brought down across the region, also trampolines. Yes, they are plague perhaps in strong winds because they've been blowing into roads and also into the path of traffic. But thankfully, we've heard no reports of other serious injuries. Which is lucky, isn't it? Well, elsewhere, there were some really major problems right across the region's travel network, weren't there, John? It's been a difficult day for travellers. Let's start on the roads. The A1M through North Yorkshire seemed to bear the brunt of the problems this morning. Those strong gales, they often whip through the Vale of York and it led to three HGVs being toppled. And that, of course, created huge tailbacks for drivers going both north and south through North Yorkshire. Onto the trains, well, Leeds was the focus of some of the problems, at least this morning. Many passengers faced delays of perhaps up to an hour. Other trains were cancelled because of problems with the overhead wires. At one point, uh, heavy duty wrapping, plastic wrapping, had fallen onto overhead wires. And then in the skies, well, did you know that Leeds Bradford Airport is actually the, the country's highest altitude civilian airport? So they're used to strong winds. This morning, three flights from Poland had to be diverted to Liverpool, slightly lower lying. And this afternoon, some holiday flights coming back from the Med from places like Faro and Malaga. Well, they faced delays before they've been able to land at Leeds Bradford itself. And of course, we're coming to the end of half term, aren't we? So there is a lot, a lot of travel at the moment. But fortunately, everything is pretty much back to normal, John. The aftermath of Storm Otto is still causing major problems elsewhere, though. There are problems. Northern Power Grid, for instance, they say 21,000 homes throughout the course of the day. That's in Yorkshire and the North East have faced power cuts. Now, they're down to around 1,700 properties now without power, but the engineers are working to restore those uh, power to the, to the various different homes, and they hope that they, they will be back on in the next few hours, perhaps by 9 o'clock tonight. John Hill, live in Sheffield for that update. Thank you so much.
Next, as we approach next week's anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, the country's volunteer soldiers have passed another milestone. 10,000 of them have been trained by Allied troops in the UK, including here in Yorkshire. Parts of our region have been turned into training battlegrounds, preparing civilians forced to take up arms to defend their country against the Russian advance. Well, for security reasons, we can't report where they or their instructors are based, other than to say that some have been training in Yorkshire. They are also careful to conceal their identities. But Michael Billington has been given rare access to them as they prepare for war. Young Ukrainian men forced into armed combat, now preparing for a war they never wanted. Most of the guys were uh, civilians, never touched a rifle in their life. Uh, we got them as civilians and uh, now they're soldiers. <laughs> They're among 10,000 volunteer soldiers who've now been trained in the UK. Well, seeing them like this, it's perhaps hard to remember that these are actually just Ukrainian civilians, but it's hoped after five weeks of intensive training here, they will return home as skilled soldiers ready to face the Russian onslaught. Taxi drivers, furniture makers and engineers on this secretive training ground in Yorkshire are being shown how to handle weapons, neutralise enemy explosives, and to understand the tactics of urban warfare. My uh, motivation and uh, moral and uh, spiritual thing, it's impossible to give them any chance to prevail. We have to win and to uh, beg them uh, from Ukraine. For me, it was very hard to observe all the awful things uh, and uh, it's, it was impossible for me to sit uh, at home and not to protect my native land from the invasion. This is an international effort. Ten Western allies are providing expertise to train Ukraine's volunteer defence forces. They have just five weeks, but this programme is tailored to match the kinds of threats they're likely to face back home. Because everyone, the instructors and the recruits, are aware of the, the stakes, um, they learn very quickly and they're extremely motivated. And uh, I'm actually surprised by the level they've achieved in just a few weeks. Smoke machines and explosions are used to replicate the realities of war. But they know while the rounds being fired here are blank, the enemy back home will be far more hostile. The stakes are high because uh, in Norway we, yeah, we train, but we train for a war that's, that's never coming. These guys are going to war, so uh, everything we teach them, they have to use. It's humbling uh, training these guys for war. Uh, most of the guys are going straight to the front line, probably, and we all seen the pictures. It can't be, get any worse than this. 20,000 more volunteers will be trained in the UK this year, underlining what the government says is its long-term commitment to stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine. Michael Billington, ITV News. Still to come on tonight's programme, nice to meet you, Prue. We catch up with the great British Bake Off star as she brings her one-woman show to Yorkshire. I hardly bake at all. In fact, my husband complains that that our house is a cake-free zone, he says. He says, I should have married Mary Berry. And we'll be finding out how a Rotherham granddad is turning this family of mice in his back garden into internet celebrities. A mother whose 21-year-old son was shot and killed while he was the passenger in a car in Sheffield says more needs to be done to rid the streets of weapons which claim lives. Monique Bates says her youngest child was in the wrong place at the wrong time when he died. She told his story at a conference in the city today where calls were made for increases in funding. For its part, the government said Britain has some of the tightest gun laws in the world. Katie Oscroft reports. A mother's love for her son at his graveside. Lamar is Monique's youngest child. He was 21 when he died, altering her life forever. Lamar was a, a beautiful soul. Um, he had the most amazing, majestic personality. Very, very educated, very intelligent little boy. 
Lamar was shot and killed less than a year ago at a car wash on Burngreave Road, hit by a single bullet as he waited in a friend's car. His mother now wants to know how the weapon used to end his life got into the wrong hands. I want to have a tough conversation with those in Parliament and ask them, how are these guns making onto the streets? We have some of the toughest gun laws. These things are happening daily in different cities and now it's spreading out into innocent people like my son. I've seen childhood friends be divided by postcodes. Monique told a room full of people all about her son today at an event to promote the Second Chance programme organised by a Sheffield boxing club. I didn't want to box. I just want to make friends. Former world champion Johnny Nelson described how he steered his own life away from crime. He's now an ambassador for Second Chance. For me, I think it's so important uh, for, young, for young boys and girls uh, at a crucial age and especially when they're coming out of school to think, right, give yourself direction. We're learning today that something like a boxing club can make a huge difference in people's lives, somewhere where the young people want to go, and that's where they're going to meet role models and mentors. But organisers say there's a cost to keeping young people on the right path. Locking people up, um, clearly it has to happen to, to perpetrators, but what we try and do is the prevention. Um, and, and for me, the, the, the finances has got to be involved in prevention. There's too much um, short-term funding being um, set out to projects for a long-term problem. The government says it is investing in measures to crack down on organised crime and to keep young people safe, but Monique Bate wants much more to be done. I'm doing this for Lamar, yeah. He inspires me every day to raise the bar um, from the beautiful legacy that he's left behind. And being angry or upset and not doing something would be an injustice. Monique says her son was caught in the crossfire of criminal activity. She doesn't want that to happen to anyone else. Katie Oscroft, ITV News, Sheffield. Time for some sport now and Super League is back. Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Yes, the first Rugby Super League game of the season took place last night. More on that in just a bit. But the first game in our region is at Wakefield Trinity this evening, where Chris Dawkes is live for us now. Good evening, Chris. How's the mood down there? Yeah, very exciting, Lara, indeed. Yeah, plenty of excitement on the pitch, as you can see behind me. Lots of youngsters, local youngsters, playing on the turf that their heroes play on as well. What a thrill for them, of course. But it's always exciting, isn't it, the start of a new season, especially here at the Wakefield Trinity, because this year they're celebrating their 150th anniversary. Lots of change both on and off the pitch during the close season. The biggest one, as you can see behind me, construction work still going on this east stand behind me. Two and a half thousand new seats being put in there. It started in June last year. They're expecting it to be completed in August this year. That's off the pitch. On the pitch as well, a raft of new signings, including Aussie Kevin Proctor. He certainly won't go unnoticed, will he? As well as a batch of talented young players down here at Wakefield Trinity as well. And in the dugout, they have a local lad pulling the strings as well. Wakefield-born Mark Applegarth is Super League's youngest coach at 38 after stepping up from assistant and and head of youth at the club. From my point of view, I, I feel ready. Uh, and as I said when I first got the job, if you don't back yourself, then who is going to back you? You know, I've got a good um, uh, team around me. You know, I've got some good senior players as well. You know, Matty Ashurst is captain. Uh, he's been great. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I, it is what it is. You've got to take your opportunity when they come, haven't you? Tigers also get their season up and running. Now, their preparations for their game at Hull FC on Sunday has been overshadowed somewhat by the controversy surrounding Joe Westerman, who was fined by the club and told to undertake community service to educate young people on the effects of alcohol. Now, head coach Lee Radford was asked at his press conference how he thinks Westerman will respond to the inevitable taunts from the crowd on Sunday. You know, the easy one is to play well, isn't it? That's that's the best way to silence the crowd. Um, but then, as a group, we want to play well. As a team, we want to play well, and we want to we want to knock our first result off of the season. So, um, you know, I'm sure Joe will be as motivated as anybody else, you know, on the field on um, on Sunday if he's to participate. Well, that's the rugby, Chris. What about this weekend's football? 
Yes, Ian, there's a huge game in the Premier League, isn't there, as Leeds travel to Everton. And one look at the league table shows you just why it's so important. Just a point separates Leeds in 17th from Everton in 18th. Now, Leeds are still yet to appoint a permanent successor to Jesse Marsh. So once again, Michael Scabala, a former PE teacher and futsal coach, will take charge. Well, I asked him whether the situation he's in overwhelms him. Overwhelming? I don't think so. I think I'm, I'm OK. I'm, I'm dealing with it. I've got a great support network around me of staff. I've got a great support network around me of, you know, the board and the club itself. And for me, I've got, I think the fans are brilliant as well. And they, hopefully they can see I'm just trying to do the best job I can do. So I wouldn't say overwhelming. I'd say exciting, really. And there's sure to be excitement at the John Smith Stadium tomorrow as well, where Neil Warnock takes charge of his first game since returning as manager of Huddersfield Town. The 74-year-old will hope to inject some belief into the Terriers, who are without a win in seven championship matches. I want them to come to the game like I did, and I've got goose pimples when I'm talking to you now, and I want them to be excited. I want them to go on talking about the game, not... Oh, the him and he can't do this and he can't do that and moaning. I want them to be excited. Listen, I can't tell you whether we can do anything like that because the fixtures show it's going to be, you know, that's why we're odds on favourite now to get relegated. But we, we've got to try and give the fans something to, to shout about and, and win games. Well, he's always good value, isn't he? Well, our cameras will be there tomorrow to capture Warnock's return. We'll have action from that and the rest of the weekend sport on calendar on Monday evening. Yeah. OK, thanks very much indeed, Chris. And uh, enjoy your sport this weekend, won't you? Thank you. The great British Bake Off judge, Prue Leith, is on the road with her first ever one-woman show. Yes, not content with being a chef, restaurateur, writer and TV judge. At the amazing age of 82, Prue is on her first tour heading to Sheffield's Memorial Hall at the end of this month. Yes, it's exciting. Nothing in moderation. We'll see the star talk about her childhood, her career, and the audience will get a chance to ask their very own questions. Lucky Natalie Bohr went to meet her. Hi, Prue. It's lovely to meet you. Hi, Natalie. I can't believe this is your first tour because you've led such an interesting life. So what's made you want to go out on tour now? I must be mad. <laughs> um... I met the producer, Clive Tullow, and he said, I think you should do a one-woman show. And that was four years ago, and I thought, no, no, no. And then it sort of stuck in my mind. And then he had just been on tour with Joanna Lumley. So I asked Joanna, what do you think? And she said, you should do it. I also asked Paul Hollywood, and he said, don't be mad. He said, it's absolutely <laughs> knackering. And the audience, they can ask you anything? Yeah. People like stories about the royal family. They like disaster stories about the catering world. Well, I've got lots of them. And then they like, a lot of women like to know about what it was like to have a business in the 70s um, for a woman. Are you getting a buzz from performing or talking to a live <laughs> audience? Do you know what? I'm really enjoying it. I hope I don't get the bug so badly. You know, there are lots of old comedians who one thinks, you know, you're past your sell-by date, you should stop now. But they can't resist it because there's this, I now understand that desire for another sort of waft of this enormous affection from, an enor from a whole lot of strangers. And you've cooked for the royal family. What was that like? I, I once had to give the Queen a cup of tea. And do you think, do you think that would be easy enough, wouldn't you? I mean, I, I, mean, I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> Well, I've, I've been a caterer for a very long time. I'd served lots of prime ministers and very, lots of fancy stuff. You'd think I could give the Queen a cup of tea. I completely cocked it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure lots of people ask you about the Great British Bake Off. What is it about the programme, do you think, that has made it so popular? It is extraordinary, is it? I think life is quite difficult. And so I think... Bake Off represents this kind of nice space where you know nobody's going to be horrible to anybody. The bakers are going to be very cooperative with each other. They'll probably even help their rivals. Um, and, and it's cake, for heaven's sake. Everybody likes cake. I hardly bake at all. In fact, my husband complains that, that our house is a cake-free zone, he says. He says, I should have married Mary Berry. He says this <laughs> frequently. <laughs> I am not a baker. No. I'd just like to say. But I have made a cake. Uh-huh. 
and I wondered whether you might oh my goodness, look possibly would you be prepared to taste it and course, try a bit? It. It's a I lemon bunt it. cake. It's all yours. And it looks so pretty and it smells lovely and my mouth's watering so that okay. can't be bad. Mm. It's lovely. Oh, oh my goodness. Mm. It's good. Prue it's lovely to meet you and good luck with the tour. Thank you very much. Mm. Prue Leaf there, who will never be past her sell-by date, will she? Certainly not. She's amazing, isn't she? Mm. Fantastic. And you're a great cook as well. You, you bake lovely cakes. You bring them into the newsroom. Yeah, and you eat them. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Now then, thousands of farmers and land managers are being urged to spend half an hour bird watching to observe and record the numbers of wild birds on their land. The annual Big Farmland Bird Count is now in its 10th year. The aim is to get a snapshot of the number of farmland birds and also support work that's being done to reverse the decline in bird species numbers. One in four species actually are said to be under threat. Kevin Ashford reports. Many bird species in this country, like the yellowhammer, are under pressure, with the decline in habitats and food sources. And that means numbers have been falling. Up-to-date information on those numbers is vital to helping tackle the problem, which is why landowners like Tom Ward Paulett at the Bolton Hall estate in Wensley have been taking part in the annual Big Farmland Bird Count. It's really important that we, we monitor bird populations and, and all sorts of other biodiversity. Clearly, um, you know, there is there is a climate and biodiversity crisis um, at the moment. Nature recovery is high on the government's agenda and we really need to understand what we have in order to, um, you know, understand how we can protect that, but also what we can improve on and, um, you know, develop and how we can improve habitats uh, and so on to support more species. This is the tenth year the bird count has taken place. In last year's survey, farmers and other land managers reported seeing 420,000 birds, covering 130 different species across one and a half million acres of land. On this farm last year, they recorded 47 species of birds, seven of them rare. The owners say it's down to their nature-friendly approach to farming. It's really important for the environment. I mean, the, the... The number of birds on a farm is a signal for how strong the environmental well-being of the farm is. We have fantastic soil counts here for organic matter in the farm because we use lots of manures and organic manures in, in the land. And so we grow great crops because of that. But at the same time, we want a healthy environment. So we plant willow for biomass and as part of that, that attracts millions of birds and then we feed them. So we attract even more of them. Those behind the bird count say the decline in species numbers is worrying. But one bright spot is that small changes can have a big impact. Things like supplementary feeding, really, really important. You feed the birds in your garden, why not feed them in your, on your farm as well? Uh, Overwinter cover crops, supplementary feeding um, and habitat management. Nice big hedgerows, overwinter stubbles, providing that food stuff during the hungry gap, which is now until May time, continue feeding till May, you'll really help out your farmland birds. The two week long big farmland bird count ends this weekend. Kevin Ashford, ITV News. Oh, beautiful. I do love to see a barn owl. I oh, know, fantastic, oh, yeah. fantastic birds. Yeah. Now, staying with nature. If you're sitting comfortably, then I will begin because if you were to go down to the bottom of Grandad Robinson's garden, well, you might be in for a big surprise. <laughs> yes, because when lockdown hit, Jess discovered he had two families of mice living in his back hedge. He decided to build them homes. He yeah. did. And yeah. it just so happened to be in Rotherham. I know. And since his grandson suggested filming their adventures and putting them online, Jez has become an internet sensation as Martin Fisher been finding out. Welcome to our garden and it looks like <laughs> the Bramble family are having some uh, a cup of Yorkshire tea. <laughs> Cute are they? Oh dear me. <laughs> For Jez Robinson documenting the antics of his furry friends has become a daily ritual. From something just to pass the time during lockdown their adventures now captivate a worldwide audience. That's it. Mm, that's it, them petals. Are you pulling them off? Oh, somebody else is having a go. <laughs> Get off, he says. Before I do anything else, I come home, have a cup of tea, fill bird feeders up, uh, fill all the rest of feeders up, and then come up and film the mice. Because people, it's like 
I suppose, watching a, a soap, uh, like Coronation Street. People wait for it now, and, you know, if you look by comments on Facebook, it's brilliant, it really is. His daily live stream attracts viewers from as far away as Brazil and Alaska and has over 180,000 followers. Uh, how it's helped him through uh, these lockdowns, um, obviously other troubles in the world, and there's been lots of them, uh, and it's just something to give him a smile. Because uh, I always chuckle on my videos and laugh because the mice make me laugh. Just builds the mice places to live with the help of his grandchildren. He, like, makes them and then, like, paints them, and they just, like, go in them and, like, just sit in them and play around. It shows them in a, a different light to what um, people normally see. But it's not just mouse houses. They also have other things to play with. Tales of the River Bank, Animal Magic, Johnny Morris, yeah. He talked to animals, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because, like, the TV's full of reality TV shows at, at the moment, and, you know, people get a bit fed up with that. So this is, like, I suppose a different direction, and it's just something to give people a smile and a laugh. <laughs> oh, sunset mouse. Martin Fisher, ITV News, in Rotherham. Well, thank you, Jez, because you certainly gave us something to laugh about today. I don't, I don't know why that story's so funny, but it <laughs> certainly set me off. It anyway, sorry him. about that. Now then, let's get the weather from Joe Blythe for the weekend. Good visibility on the horizon. Tui sponsors ITV Yorkshire weather. Thank you. Hello, good evening. A very warm welcome to the weekend. It is actually looking mild over the next couple of days with rather blustery conditions, but lots of dry weather on both days to get out and about. Into next week, something slightly colder developing. It'll be unsettled certainly over the next couple of days through the weekend, but then gradually into next week, high pressure begins to build in, settling things down, but introducing some colder air from the north. So we will see a return to overnight frost as we go through next week, certainly from Tuesday night onwards. Back to this evening, bits and pieces of patchy rain working their way eastwards across our part of the world for a time. And after midnight, some slightly heavier rain moving in from the northwest, probably when we're all in bed and moving through quite promptly. So by dawn, it's a good deal drier across the board. A breezy night, and we're free from frost. Seven or eight Celsius are overnight low. On to tomorrow. First of all, the sun will be rising at 7.20, setting tomorrow evening at 5.21. Saturday, perhaps if you're out and about early, there could be just one or two rogue showers about. But from quite early on, some nice sunshine as well. It'd certainly be a blustery day. And there's a chance of one or two showers during the afternoon. But lots of dry weather too. Decent for getting out and about. Slightly more cloud cover later. And temperature-wise, it's still mild. 12 or 13 Celsius. More cloud developing through tomorrow night. Another mild night to come. And Sunday should be largely dry as well, if a little cloudy. It's a very similar story on Monday. High pressure beginning to build in and certainly settles things down as we go through the week next week. But it will turn colder, both by day and night. Have a lovely weekend. Tui sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. And whatever you're doing, we hope you have a lovely weekend. I have to tell you, thank goodness it's Friday, because you've got me worn out, Laura Ross. It, it was those mice. It was the I mice. I don't know what it was. was. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> thank you very much for watching. We've enjoyed being here with you. Have a fantastic weekend, and we will see you next week. Good night. Bye-bye.